So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Chris Fregley, Principal Solution Architect for AWS, specializing in generative AI and uh, all things um, related to that, including SageMaker, including uh, Parallel Cluster and HPC, all the fun things that are related. Uh, data processing is becoming more and more required uh, those kind of skills and seeing a lot of customers using Spark for these things. So all of the old classic, uh, you know, data prep certainly does come in handy for getting the best training data for your models. Uh, and so this month, we do this every third Monday of every month, and we do it at a, um, a time that's friendly to the Europeans, not so friendly, well, yeah, not so friendly for me because I have to wake up early. Uh, like eight in the morning or whatever. Um, but actually today I'm on the East Coast. So today was nice. Um, I was able to wake up uh, at a normal time and then start this at 12. Uh, but we do cater to the Europeans. We will also um, post this. Everything gets posted to HTTPS, YouTube, uh, or to uh, generative, uh, no, to YouTube, it's uh, generative AI on AWS.com. That's where we're going to post this. And we have an exciting lineup here. So after the intros, um, we do have a great talk from two of my coworkers, Farouk and Ravi. These folks, um, I, had, I was pulled in to help review a blog post that actually hasn't quite gone out yet, but you're going to see the code repo and, and some of the slides for this. Now we're we're going to deploy um, multi-tenant chatbot that uses RAG and the new Amazon Bedrock service. And all of this runs on top of our Kubernetes, uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service, Amazon EKS. So quite possibly every awesome buzzword um, and these folks have pulled it all together into this uh, super useful ran right out of the box. So I really encourage you folks to you know try to run it directly from the GitHub repo that they'll post here in a bit. Um, so excited! And when when Farouk and you know Ravi take over, they can introduce themselves. Um, and then I'm going to finish up. So they should take about thirty, you know, maybe thirty five minutes with Q and A. I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of of questions answers. So they are actually covering Bedrock with RAG, and then um, I will dive a little bit deeper and show some notebooks um, and a, a, about four or five different ways to do RAG with Langchain and Bedrock. So RAG is Retrieval Augmented Generation, where we're going to augment, um, you know, our searches, our our question answers, um, you know, things that we might want to get some current info, like who won last night's uh, San Francisco 49ers uh, football game, the American football game. So I'd be interested in finding that because I didn't actually see the end of the game. So, um, and Ancha, do you want to introduce yourself real quick and then we can hand it over? Yeah, sure. So Ancha Bart, Principal Developer Advocate at AWS, pretty much focusing exclusively on generative AI these days and co-hosting these meetups with Chris. Also, just a quick, again, housekeeping item. Um, everyone is muted, um, but please feel free to find the chat window. And maybe Chris can stop sharing my yearbook pictures here. Um, but yeah, post any- AI generated. I know. AI generated yearbook. <laughs> <laughs> Not real. Feel free to post your questions in the chat throughout the meetup today. And I have a fear that those images will keep popping up here. Yeah. All right. Uh um, and also, we, we do have this book uh, that Ancha and I have based quite a lot of our material on um, for these events, and we encourage you to check it out. It should be, this says December 26th, this actually is, um, this will be dropping in November. So uh, get your, your pre-order on, and um, this price actually will, you know, go down quite a bit, I think, once the uh, sale actually hits. So um, and Amazon will like refund you with whatever the price is. So, Ancha, is that it for you? <laughs> That's it. Let's what end it over. This? this was uh, probably, yeah. Uh, I mean, you what have to tell it? me here. It's probably 96 ish. <laughs> okay. And then the, the angst. Oh, no, this is your like Catholic. This school. is my, my bookworm face. Book, okay. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> All right, so, let's send it over to Farouk and, and Ravi. Yeah, take it away, guys. 
Awesome. Pluto, do you want to share your screen? Yes, just give me one second. I can't do that. Stop sharing and I'll stop my video. All right. Cool. So I'll kick it off. Uh, my name is Ravi Yadav, and I lead our containers go to market for our ISV and digital native customers. Uh, together with me here is Farooq Kashif, uh, who's a senior solutions architect at AWS. Uh, now, today we are going to be talking about uh, building a multi tenant chatbot with RAG uh, using Amazon Bedrock and Amazon EKS. So, as Chris mentioned, we're probably going to be using like all the buzzwords in the world. So, please bear us with that. <laughs> now, uh, next slide, please. Now, working with customers and throughout the industry, uh, one thing we've all seen is that machine learning is going through an interaction point, which is driven by a few things. Now, one of the things is compute capacity is increasing, uh, the data sizes are growing, and the models themselves are becoming more sophisticated, both in terms of the architecture of the machine learning models, as well as the use cases that they can support. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, as a result of these models becoming more sophisticated and being able to uh, process a lot of the data and being able to process a lot of unstructured data, the end result is that these models are getting better, a lot of, uh, better at a lot of different use cases. Now, these are things like code generation, uh, image generation, and other modalities like music generation or video generation. And a lot of these use cases are around things like text analysis or text summarization, as well as some text generation as well. So there's definitely a huge surge in the Gen AI space. And when it comes to choosing the right infrastructure, uh, there are considerations, both in terms of the performance requirements, the cost requirement, latency requirements, and ease of use, and so on and so forth. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, let's touch on why EKS for AI ML. Now, once customers have made a choice of using containers, uh, based on the advantages that it provides, Kubernetes is a natural evolution for orchestrating those containers, along with a wide array of tooling that exists around Kubernetes. Now, when it comes to AWS, uh, running Kubernetes on AWS, EKS is the best way to run Kubernetes because of the managed control plane that we provide, where, wherein a lot of the heavy lifting that customers would need to do, it gets put onto AWS and customers need to only worry about developing their applications. Now, why EKS for AIML specifically? Now, it's to address uh, various challenges uh, in training our inference. So it's things like scaling challenges, uh, infrastructure failures, multi-tenancy, and, and cost effectiveness as well. So EKS addresses each of these challenges directly by using the native Kubernetes capabilities, uh, like using automated scaling, increased resiliency, uh, and workload isolation, as well as uh, it being a cost-effective solution as well. Now, we'll take a, as we go through the slides, we'll take a look at each of these elements. Um, automated scaling, for instance, it's sort of an inherent functionality within Kubernetes that comes out of the box. Uh, you can scale based on the parameters that are configurable. Uh, you can define parameters under which Kubernetes would need to scale and also provide your workloads more resources. And on top of that, EKS provides auto scaling groups that makes it easy for you to orchestrate bringing up nodes as well as adding those nodes to your EKS cluster. Now, in terms of increased uh, resiliency, it's again a native sort of functionality where you have a desired state configured for your cluster. Uh, Kubernetes under the hood has controllers that ensures that it constantly monitors the infrastructure and keeps the infrastructure up to date to the desired state that you have configured. Now, Another challenge uh, that Kubernetes addresses is multi-tenancy. Uh, many of our customers want to share a single cluster across multiple organizational units or teams within the organization. Uh, Kubernetes, again, in this uh, here, provides native workload isolation through namespaces, for instance, uh, which can be used to share a cluster across multiple teams and used for multiple use cases. And finally, uh, another benefit that you get by using uh, EKS Kubernetes is that Kubernetes has a whole ecosystem of open source solutions that you can configure to provide uh, device plugins or drivers that you can configure on your cluster uh, to be able to provide direct access to GPU resources and also uh, providing you the ability to partition and deploy multiple diverse workloads across the same GPU, ensuring you're efficient and you're maximizing the use of GPUs across your cluster 
as well. And then cost effectiveness. Uh, EKS offers you the ability to pick and choose which type of EC2 instances you want to use. So whether that EC2 spot or any type of EC2 instance, uh, as well as the processors. So that you want to use that AWS provides for getting a balance of things like uh, high throughput, low latency, uh, while being able to meet your budget constraints. Next slide, please. Now, before we get into the architecture of building a chatbot using Amazon Bedrock and EKS, we want to introduce uh, some of the concept, concepts that we'll be referring to throughout the presentation here. Uh, retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG, is a common pattern where, where the general purpose language model is queried with a user question along with additional contextual information extracted from some private documents uh, to then being able to generate text based on the context. Now, foundational models are trained on general domain corpus, making them less effective for domain-specific tasks, uh, where you can use uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG uh, to, to retrieve the data from outside a foundational model and augment your prompts by adding the uh, relevant retrieved data and context. Now, with RAG, the external data used to augment your prompts can come from multiple data sources, so things like document repositories, databases, or even APIs. And using the RAG uh, provides several benefits like improved accuracy, increased relevance, and improved reliability and responses. All right, now with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Farooq here, who's going to introduce a few more concepts before we get into the uh, chatbot architecture. Awesome, Ravi. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll just get into a little bit of uh, introduction on why, uh, you know, what is a chatbot? Why? Uh, what is multi-tenancy or why we're using multi-tenancy and how does Gen AI help here. So uh, the, the, we, we're demonstrating a chatbot because there are uh, a lot of common use cases that we see uh, out there in the uh, with, with our customers. Uh, they're used in customer support, uh, product Q&A, billing inquiries, payments, uh, refunds, and so on and so forth. And recently I've heard uh, Stanford University, for example, has been experimenting uh, a chatbot, uh, which is uh, GNAI based, uh, they are experimenting with patients who are uh, who have mental disabilities, uh, and and they are experimenting uh, a chatbot for uh, treating them. So that's that's an awesome use case. So there are there are infinitely many possibilities where various organizations are putting chatbots to uh, to various uh, use cases. Um, multi tenancy helps uh, each of these chatbots specialized. Uh, specialize on a tenant specific contextual data. So, so essentially, uh, it, each of those instances of the chatbot that is uh, running on in, in our specific case on EKS on on different containers uh, can be specialized to a particular data set. Uh, as Ravi was just mentioning, uh, the RAG mechanism. So, each of these instances can be uh, you know pulling data from their own RAG sources. Uh, and it, what happens is basically the tenant specific context is combined with uh, generative AI uh, and it can provide a more engaging customer experience, uh, particularly with the, with the customer specific data getting into, uh, into the mix and providing uh, a, a very uh, you know, clearly uh, context specific uh, information coming in. It'll be it'll provide typically a, a more engaging experience with with, with customers. Uh, again, a little bit of uh, background on what foundation models are. Uh, they are large language models that are pre-trained on vast amounts of data, and they are adaptable to many tasks. Uh, you must have been hearing this uh, over and over again several times over the past few months. But just uh, just a refresher for everyone. Uh, AWS offers several uh, foundation models through AWS SageMaker, Jumpstart. Uh, uh, and and these are a few examples. There are many others. So Llama 2, Falcon, uh, Flunty 5, GPTJ are a few examples. There are several other models that are available through uh, SageMaker Jumpstart. And also uh, Bedrock, which offers an API-based uh, access to uh, foundation models and a number of foundation models from uh, our uh, various partners and also Amazon, uh, Anthropic, AI21, Stability, and Cohere. Um, also a bit of background onto embeddings because embeddings play a significant role in the architecture that we're going to discuss. Uh, and also typically in RAG, 
based architectures, embeddings are an important feature. So we just wanted to give a bit of a refresh on that too. So embeddings help encode data into vectors uh, that capture meaning and context. Uh, they also essentially help in finding similar data uh, by searching for neighboring data points. Uh, and, and there are many, many different algorithms that, that are in use that are available uh, on, on various uh, platforms for doing that kind of search and to make it more efficient. Uh, and an embeddings model is again a, uh, a category of large language model that converts supplied text into uh, a vector. Uh, so it's just a very simplified example of what uh, an embeddings model does. So you, you have a document, you're taking pieces of it and you're running it against an embeddings model and it generates uh, the series of numbers for you in the form of a list, which uh, we call vectors. And, and you continue doing it uh, through your entire corpus of documents and, and store these into uh, what are vector databases. So uh, vector databases enable storage and retrieval of these vectors that we just generated uh, using our embedding model. Uh, they also support efficient and fast lookup of nearest neighbors in an n-dimensional space. So, uh, uh, you know, some of the vector databases support up to uh, dimensions, which are pretty large, like up to 16,000 uh, dimensions. Uh, some support smaller uh, dimensions, but uh, there they are vector databases that support large dimensions. Uh, and the most important piece here uh, in a multi-tenant perspective is that they help operationalize uh, embeddings models. So these support scalability, they support fault tolerance, access control, indexing, query, and so on and so forth. Uh, and AWS offers two, uh, two vector databases. Uh, one of them is based on PostgreSQL with, with, post, with a PG vector plugin uh, and Amazon OpenSearch. And of course, there are others like Pinecone, which are also AWS partners. So, so those solutions are also available on uh, on the AWS, in the AWS environment through the marketplace. Now we get into a bit of high level uh, of this solution uh, and see what it consists of, and then we'll we'll again dive a little deeper as well. Uh, so it's built on Amazon EKS, as has been discussed from the beginning of our session. Uh, we use an ingress controller, of which there are many out there. Uh, several, uh, you know, several solutions are available as an ingress controller. But in our specific case, as you can see in our uh, in our core repo as well, we're using uh, Istio because of the various uh, features that it supports, uh, specifically for multi-tenancy. Uh, and we. In our demo or in, in our code repo as well, the, the example that we've set up, it consists of two tenants. So each tenant have uh, their own uh, application or chatbot deployed with an EKS as a pod. Uh, and when the tenant accesses, uh, tries to access the chatbot, the request is intercepted by the English controller. It goes to uh, an identity provider, which in our case is uh, Amazon Cognito, uh, which we use as an identity provider. Uh, it gets authenticated. Requests are forwarded to the chatbot. Uh, the chatbot application, uh, e technically, each one can have its own vector database. Uh, in our case, we, 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 as we'll explain, we're using a, the, an in-memory uh, vector index. Uh, but you could have a separate separate vector database for each tenant, or you could partition a database into a multi-tenant uh, uh, through a multi-tenant multi-tenancy mechanism into uh, separate uh, partitions and each one could be dedicated to a uh, tenant. And also these uh, chat applications, they're talking to foundation models. So there are two foundation models that we uh, use in our, uh, in our example. One is a text-based model and one is the vector uh, embeddings model. Uh, we also need a data ingestion process. So uh, as we talked about uh, embeddings and vector databases, so we need a mechanism to search uh, in our document repository. So the ingestion mechanism in our case is, uh, you know, imagining that your raw data is sitting in an S3 bucket uh, and you have your embeddings model, uh, which is in our case, the Titan embeddings model. Uh, and we have a vector database, again, in our case, in the in-memory vector index. And there is a ingestion process that reads uh, your data from the S3 uh, bucket. 
it generates embeddings uh, running against the embeddings model and then uh, pushes those uh, vectors that are generated into the vector database. And this is a process. This is uh, uh, this is kind of imagined to be done prior uh, to uh, to your uh, to the customer's access to the chatbot because when they are accessing the chatbot, that this data should already be. Uh, in the vector database, or it could be an ongoing process. So as you add more documents to your uh, repository, you could continue to ingest more and more uh, data into the vector database. Going into uh, a little bit of the various components that we use for building this uh, this example chatbot. So our chatbot is based on a Streamlit-based interface, uh, which helps really develop a, a chat interface uh, extremely fast. Uh, for the RAG piece of it, we're using Fast API, uh, which uh, which is a REST-based API, and it, uh, it it runs the LangChain uh, framework for LLM task or, uh, orchestration. Uh, we're using Face, which is Facebook's AI similarity search in memory vector database index, as you know I've been discussing. So essentially, it's the Face database that we use, but it could be. Uh, replaced with any other uh, vector databases that are out there with minor changes to your code. And last but not the least, we're, we're using LangChain uh, for orchestrating various uh, uh, model tasks, including chat history management and prompt engineering. Let's get into what happens when a chat request comes in. Uh, it's, it's getting cluttered, so clear that, okay. So, so imagine the, an end customer or user initiates a request to a, uh, an endpoint, tenant.example.com. Uh, the request gets to the ingress controller, as you saw in our high-level architecture drawing. Uh, the ingress controller is going to run it through the identity provider, uh, and the request comes back with uh, some sort of a tenant context or a token. Uh, and then it is the request is sent back by the ingress controller to uh, the tenant namespace that we create specifically for each tenant and the part that is running within that tenant namespace. And again, just a refresher. So namespace is a Kubernetes construct that is used for uh, a logical separation between various uh, workloads. Uh, so the request lands on the chatbot uh, container, which is part of that pod, uh, which is running the Streamlit interface. Uh, and once that is, uh, you know, once a user enters something into the chat interface, uh, that request or, or prompt is sent to the RAG API piece, which is an, running in another container. Uh, so RAG API is just, just my <laughs> kind of uh, naming convention. It, it's, it has nothing to do with, uh, with, with, you know, with, with the standard terminology. It's just a name that I chose for that, that specific piece of code. Uh, it is running the the LangChain frameworks, running the face uh, interface, uh, you know, calls and so on, and it also, uh, you know, the the part basically also creates a sessions table in uh, DynamoDB. Uh, so whenever there's a there's there's a chat initiated, it creates a, a session ID, and it tracks the session based on that session ID, uh, and that session ID is also passed to uh, the LangChain interface. Uh, so that it can also keep the chat history uh, based on that session ID. Uh, and that chat history is also kept in uh, DynoDB. Uh, LangChain provides a native interface to uh, DynoDB for uh, storing chat history. Um, the RAG API component also uh, takes care of talking to the models, of course, via LangChain. Uh, it sends the request. It, it, you know, it, does, uh, it does all the cycles through uh, the uh, basically the uh, the embeddings model and also the language model uh, and it takes care of that and and we'll see that in 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 the next couple of slides uh, on on how that cycles through and then eventually it it gets the response and returns back to the user and we'll we'll dive into that a little bit deeper in the next slide so here you have the chatbot container uh, the user input comes in. So for example, the user is asking question, what are foundation models? Uh, so what the what the container does first is goes and creates or retrieves a session ID. So if the user is just continuing from a previous, uh, previous input, it'll just simply retrieve that session ID. Uh, or 
if the user is entering something for the first time, it's going to create a new session ID. It gets the session ID and it sends the request along with the session ID to the RAG API container. Uh, the RAG API container is going to go and retrieve or create a chat history entry into the table. Uh, and it's going to store the user input, take the user input and the history and send it to the embeddings model uh, and get an embeddings or vector back uh, based on that vector that it gets, it's going to retrieve uh, similar documents uh, from the vector database. And putting it all together, the user input, the history, and the retrieved documents. Uh, and again, the, the step six is essentially what is the, the RAG mechanism. Uh, it puts all of those together as a context and sends it to uh, the text model in order to get a, uh, a response or an output, which is then sent back along with, uh, in our case, we specifically ask it to send along with the sources, so uh, references to where this information is coming from, back to the user. And uh, steps four, five, six, and seven are, uh, are all managed by uh, the Langchain framework. I know there's, there's a lot here, so we'll, we'll We'll, we'll talk about it during some of it during uh, the demo as well. And the last piece of architecture that I just wanted to touch upon is the uh, the pod architecture. So how does the pod access all of this uh, these external pieces? So we create an IAM role for our chatbot application. And again, these are uh, the, the, you could create multiple roles, uh, one each for every tenant, or you could have uh, a session based. Um, a credentials mechanism as well. There are there are advanced mechanisms of creating a single role and then sharing them across many tenants and then per session generate separate credentials. Uh, but regardless of that, so this role has access to uh, the S3 bucket. So there's the policy to, ac to access S3 bucket and also a policy to access uh, DynamoDB uh, tables that, that belong to this specific tenant. Uh, we have a tenant namespace, uh, a Kubernetes namespace, uh, we also create a, a, a service account uh, per tenant. And this service account has a mapping uh, with this IAM role that we created, which is called in uh, AWS parlance URSA uh, or IAM roles for service account, uh, which basically gives uh, the specific permissions to S3 and Dynamo database uh, uh, to that service account. And then we have our chatbot pod, which consists of the containers, uh, the two containers that uh, basically form the foundation of the application. And with that, uh, just wanted to share this GitHub link. Uh, if you're interested in trying uh, this out yourself, uh, we're, we're also working on a uh, blog post, which is expected to come shortly. Uh, so if, you, if you're also interested in that, we'll, once, once it comes out, we're going to uh, update the readme on the GitHub as well to add a link to, uh, to the blog post. Um, so we're expecting this to come out very soon in the next couple of weeks. And with that, I'll jump to a quick demo. Uh, Chris, if you want to say something, you're free to do it while I switch uh, screens. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we've got a couple Good questions here. Do you want to take them now, or do you want to wait till uh, we uh, we we can take them now, or, or if you want to wait till the demo, or maybe some of them will be yeah uh, clarified by the demo. Right. Looks like um, was Bedrock mentioned in the the slides? Uh, I thought it was right. Was Bedrock in there? Yes. Yes. It Okay, and it's in the demo that you're going to show, also obviously. So uh, we'll see that. Yeah, specifically, uh, we are not going to the Bedrock console. We'll we'll just right. stick to the, the the you know basically the chat interface and a bit of the DynamoDB uh, tables. Uh, but you know all details are available in the uh, in the GitHub. So so the readme yeah. is pretty detailed. Uh, you know. We, we've tried to list every step in there, so it should be it should be pretty clear. If and if there are any things that are that are missed, please feel free to reach out to us, and you know we can we can definitely uh, answer any other questions that are related to that. Yeah, and so here's a fun one: What's the difference between a vector library like space and a vector database? 
like uh, you know, like a pine cone or something. We've been getting this question quite a lot recently. Okay, so vector uh, library is essentially a uh, it, it's a component that you use in your uh, in your development that helps you connect to a vector database. And, and vector database is the repository where you're going to store your vectors. And the library essentially provides you the uh, you know the, the calls that you're going to make or the API uh, which you're going to use to uh, connect to that vector database and be able to read and write or, or search or, or all the all the capabilities that the, that vector database provides. Right. Yeah. So the way I usually describe it is that vector library like base vice is is it is not the scalable option that you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Like a vector database can be, you know, scaled horizontally, can be spread up um, like across a whole bunch of instances, and that's really the value proposition. Um, but something like like face can be used right in your notebook, but it's using the uh, file system as the actual vector database. Uh, right. Correct. Yeah. So face is more for prototyping. I would say when when you're doing experimentation, it it provides a really nice uh, nice mechanism to you know quickly integrate it into your application. Uh, it's it's memory resident. It's very fast. Uh, but again, it does not provide you enterprise features like you know failover and clustering and scalability and you know some of the the topics that we talked about when we said operationalizing your a vector database so so those features uh, would definitely be provided by uh you know vector databases of a of a you know of a different breed okay and one last real quick question um the the rag portion is keeping the conversation history for just a specific user um so just a specific tenant correct so the conversation uh, we, history is isolated yeah we, we we will just see that how how that works uh, Perfect. in the demo very, very quickly. Awesome, man. Take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just share my screen again. Switch to my browser. Um, all right. So do you see my browser now? Yes, we, we do. do. Perfect. So, so this is basically the interface that I talked about, the Streamlit interface. Uh, it it has a number of pieces, as you can see. Even though it's been pretty uh, pretty static, so you know you can you can choose you can you can put in multiple models, but in this case we just have one. Uh, it's the text to text model, uh, and we only have one uh, embeddings model. So our text to text model is Claude uh, V1, and in you know again the the mode here is RAG. Uh, but you could have other modes as well. Uh, so for example, if you're doing things like, you know, image uh, kind of generation and so on. So you could have various types of options here, or you could even get rid of this completely because it's not necessarily needed in our use case. Uh, and here, as you can see, we are identifying uh, the specific user who has logged in. So I have already logged in just to save some time here. So we have the tenant ID, uh, which is, you know, assuming that the, the user belongs to an organization uh, which has a tenant ID in the system. So we have tenant 80, which identifies the organization. And then we also have the user identified by the user's email. Uh, so this is tenant A and this is user one at tenant A. And I also have another tenant that is uh, logged in, which is tenant B uh, as the organization or the tenant ID. And the user is uh, user one at tenant B. So just to show you uh, that you know they're they're both logging in at the same time. They're logging in through different uh, identity providers. Each one of them is in is an instance of Amazon Cognito, but they're configured separately. So let me just uh, and, and yeah, before I go into any any uh, specific prompts, I just want to show you some of the DynamoDB setup as well. So we have a DynamoDB sessions table for 10A, and again there is you know. These naming conventions are just my own, so you could you could choose any naming conventions. Doesn't matter. So currently, there's nothing in this in this table. No sessions created since I have cleared everything out just to make it make it easier for everybody to see. Uh, and we also have a chat history, and this is for ten and A. And similarly, nothing here at the moment. And we also have a sessions table for ten and B and a chat history table for ten and B. So with that, I'll just jump into entering some prompts here. 
uh, I'll just put this prompt in here saying, what are SageMaker Foundation models? <clears throat> and yeah, so we get a response. Okay, so there's something going on here. Couldn't... Okay, but at least we got the response from the model. So it says SageMaker Foundation models, a collection of pre-trained high quality models. You know, it talks about BERT, ResNet, and so on and so forth. So fairly reasonable answer here. Uh, and and I don't want to dwell on it for too long. Just want to show you on the other side also for so tenant A has basically as a rag source. It's depending on the FAQ data for Amazon SageMaker, and my tenant B is uh, pulling in as a rag source the uh, FAQs for Amazon EMR, uh, which is a, a, an implementation of Hadoop uh, on uh, on AWS. So on tenant B, I'm going to ask a question about related to EMR and hopefully we're gonna get an answer. And, and just wanted to show you here that it comes back with the source information as well. So I've ingested my data as a CSV file, uh, which includes the uh, SageMaker FAQs uh, as a question, as well as the answer. And th these are the public FAQs that are there on the, uh, the Amazon SageMaker uh, FAQ website as well. Uh, so here I, I had asked the question, uh, what are the, the applications of Impala, which is a component of, uh, of Hadoop. So, it, you know, it, it comes back with quite a lot of details about Impala and, and mentions the source as the EMR fact. Right, so coming back to our DynamoDB table, uh, we'll just refresh it and see if this... All right, so as we can see now, we have an entry here. So so this there's a session ID that is tied to this user. Uh, and again, this tenant ID is, you know, it can be anything. I've just chosen it to have the uh, tenant ID as well as the user email uh, concatenated together. And there's a session ID here, which we will also see in the chat history. So it seems my session has expired, so I'll have to refresh. Okay. Okay, so we can see that we have a, yeah, we got a session here, which is tenant A. Uh, again, it's a, it's a long string. It's the tenant ID, the user email, and the session ID that was generated by, uh, by Streamlit. And it also stores the, the, uh, the history here. And we can see that it can, yeah, it, yeah, it can, it'll scroll through and, it has the question that I that I had asked, which is, what are our SageMaker Foundation models? It, it's it's pretty long. You could you could copy it to uh, you know a text uh, notepad or something and and see the details. Um, and also, yeah, as as you continue to ask more questions here, uh, it it will it'll add to that history. Uh, and the same for the uh, the other uh, DynamoDB tables. So we do have a. For example, we'll just go here. All right. So here is also a session ID for tenant B. So we have tenant B and the, the user that's associated with tenant B and the session ID. Uh, and again, a chat history that's associated with that tenant uh, or with that user specifically, uh, which has the, again, the tenant ID, the user email, and the session ID that was generated here. And the, the, the text that was captured from, uh, as you can see, what are the applications in Pala, and it also keeps uh, yeah, uh, all the details that are that are related to that. And that's all that I wanted to show in the demo. Any questions related to this? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Ansha, did you see some questions that you wanna? Yeah, first of all, thanks so much. <laughs> I really yeah. enjoyed this this presentation and the demo, and I think um our attendees as well. Um we do have a couple of questions here. Let me scan through maybe the uh bigger ones. So Fice, um Fice is working out of memory, right? Um correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, it's storing, yeah. So someone asked if FICE is storing the FICE index in S3 or is it locally on the instance where this is running? So, uh, yes, yeah, very interesting question. So so you can, you can actually see this in, in action in, in our code. So what we do is when we ingest the data, uh, we basically putting it in memory. And then once all the documents are ingested, we push it into an S3 bucket. And when the RAG API container starts, it basically pulls that index from the S3 bucket and loads it into memory. So, so again, that's that's the mechanism that we use. But again, that's a bit of a disadvantage if you're thinking to use it in, in a production environment, right? You, if, if your indexes are very large, it'll take them very, very long time to, to load. Uh, and also it, it requires very large amounts of memory uh, if the indexes are large. Right. What would be the next step that you would do to production? Oh, so there were a couple questions about, I guess, like user history isolation and, you know, you don't want one user, even within the same tenant, to see another user's history. And so right now it's scoped to an individual user, right? They can't see uh, each other's. Correct. Yeah. So the history is not visible to the user at all because the user, all they see is basically this chat interface. They they mm -hmm. don't have access to any of this. This this is all backend information that is maintained by uh, the application. Uh, and again, these are these are per user. And you could also set. I mean, what I've used in the, in the interface is basically I've set a timeout for five minutes. So if the user is inactive for five minutes, it's going to start a new session. Right, so essentially this, this again depends on uh, user's focus. If the user's fo focus has gone away, you could, you could start a new session. But the, again, coming back to the point, it's uh, user specific, the session ID, as well as the chat history. So so this is tied to a specific user. And and it is very common to do that for, for downstream applications, for example, for sentiment analysis and you know uh, customer relationships and so on. So so this, this history can be very useful for other uh, business purposes as well. Um, okay, and if, if there's a billion users, there'll be a billion Dynamo tables, is that correct? Uh, so n not necessarily, again, depends on how you structure uh, your application. So here we're structuring by tenant. Uh, so the number, so tenant is typically an organization, which is a customer organization maybe, and each organization may have multiple users within them, maybe in thousands. So, so, so these these could all be structured differently as well. You could you could put multiple tenants in the same Dynamo DB, uh, with uh, and, and there are, uh, you know, access mechanisms that can that can control access to specific tenant data, uh, only limited to that tenant's application. There are several um, patterns out there, uh, and, and we do have like AWS has. Uh, content on uh, on those patterns. Yeah, those are pretty well documented. Yep. Okay. Um, and I think another good question would be if if you weren't using RAG here and you were fine tuning one each model, you know, per tenant or per user, you would essentially just not even perform the rag, right? Let's say you were always ingesting the latest news every single night. Um, and instead you would call bedrock, you would call a fine tuned version of, of a bedrock model. Is that correct? Uh, it, it is possible. Uh, it is uh, possible theoretically, but uh, I think from a cost perspective, it may become uh, extremely costly uh, if you're, fine tuning uh, for every single tenant uh, and and imagine like large organizations they have thousands of tenants maybe uh, it may become uh, you know extremely costly for them so so this is one of the reasons why rag model or rag approach has become very popular uh, because that uh, that helps kind of uh, manage that cost instead of having to fine tune for each tenant you could use the rag approach for uh, you know being getting closer to that. Um, from an EKS standpoint, so there's one pod running per tenants. Can I scale that out? Have multiple uh, pods per tenant? 
Correct. Yeah. So, so uh, you can use the standard Kubernetes features for scaling. So there's a horizontal pod scaler. So you could scale the same pod multiple times when you see, uh, you know, based on certain, um, let's say, parameters that you're monitoring uh, in terms of uh, the, the load that's coming to your application. Uh, you could scale the pod uh, or you could deploy multiple pods from, from the get-go uh, to handle, let's say, a, uh, you know, a, a base, uh, you know, level of requests, uh, a number of requests, and then scale based on based on demand. So, so standard e e Kubernetes features, EKS features, uh, AWS monitoring features, you could you could leverage those to scale any of these uh, in whichever dimensions you like. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Ancha, do you see any other questions or? Otherwise, we only have about 14 minutes left for yeah, myself. Yeah, I think we have to move on, but maybe one last one um, around the chat history. Um, and I think pretty much this is configurable, right? Like how long is the chat history retained and used without impacting performance? And then kind of a similar one, what if the company doesn't want to store any chat history at all? <laughs> Uh, yeah, correct. Absolutely. This is optional. So this is something that we have included just to, you know, describe this feature or, you know, kind of explain this feature. Uh, and also, like, in terms of sizing, uh, we're using DynamoDB, and DynamoDB has a size per, per item. A maximum size is 400K. Uh, and, and not just that. So uh, LangChain supports multiple different backends for storing chat history. So you could use MongoDB, you could use PostgreSQL. There, there are many uh, options that are out there. So so depending on your choice, you could choose not to store chat history, which is perfectly fine. Uh, or if you want to choose store chat history in DynamoDB or Mongo or a, a, a backend of your choice, it's, it's you know, multiple choices are available. Perfect. Cool. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Once again, I was absolutely blown away here um, when I saw this. Uh, I think it's a good starting point for customers that are trying to create, you know, very specialized uh, RAG applications. And those of you already using EKS, perfect. Um, and it's one of those projects where, yeah, I know Farouk and Ravi, they 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 work on a lot of things all the time. And um, I was not surprised when it ran right out of the box, which is sometimes rare when us essays get, get coding and coding, we don't, um, or we might miss something. So yeah, great job right out of the box, that stuff is working. And the, the GitHub repo we've posted a couple times now is also on the um, QR code, but maybe I, I, we can. Yeah, I can I can probably put it there for another minute or so, maybe. Uh, so just uh, going back again. So if, if people want to take a snap of this. Yeah, cool. and if you if you have a couple more minutes, Farouk and Ravi, if you want to maybe answer a couple more questions in the chat while you're here. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. yeah, perfect. I know there's a lot yeah. of interest and people were asking what's what's a good way to reach out maybe um, for follow up questions. I don't know if you. Yeah, so our um, LinkedIn LinkedIn handles are here. So if if anyone of any one of you want to connect, feel free. And Claude two is available on Bedrock. Um, I think you you guys were just using one. Uh, they both was... are available. Yes. So so when we yeah. started out, it was version right. one, uh, but then now uh, there are three versions of Claude that are available. There's a Claude Instant. There's version one and version two. Uh, so so yes, they are all. Once the GA has happened, we have all these three available. Nice, that's nice. Okay, uh, let's switch. I'm gonna grab the screen and I'm gonna go through some, uh, let's see, stop the other person screen sharing. Yep, there we go. And maybe you can handle some of the questions, Chris, while you're showing it. Like, I think we had a question like uh, different SageMaker and Bedrock. Uh, oh, the, the difference between SageMaker and Bedrock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, say, I mean, I would consider SageMaker, if, if you want full control, and if you want to, for example, pre-train your own model, um, I think you would go SageMaker. Uh, if you're like an AI engineer just trying to try out some of these models and 
uh, productionize them and not necessarily worry too much about hosting your own models, um, Bedrock is a great choice. And let me post a GitHub link here. That way, some of you have to drop here. Um, we do have a GitHub repo that's associated with our upcoming book here, and I'm going to send you the 12 bedrock. Uh, so this is uh, the repo I'm showing today. So 12 bedrock has actually, so that's chapter 12. All of these are broken down by chapter by chapters um, in this repo and it's kind of the intro chapter all the way through fine tune RLHF uh, multimodal. We also show how to do multimodal control net and RLHF and, and then all of that kind of leads up and set, you know, so basically all of these, these chapters from one through 11 are all SageMaker. And then we show you, oh, by the way, you could actually do quite a lot of these things with very little, um, you know, um, right, like heavy lifting, and you could just use Bedrock. And you can even fine tune your own models with Bedrock. And uh, yeah, there's an example here where you can fine tune Titan, you can fine tune, I think you can fine tune Claude as well. Um, and some of these things are not yet GA, so they're not necessarily um, open for you to run right now. You have to become right, like allow listed and uh, request it. But I think hopefully in, in a couple months, uh, all of these will be GA. Um, right now, Claude is the one that I tend to use just personally. Um, so there's a bunch of Claude examples in here, uh, but we do have, you know, almost all of these are ragged. And so that's the, the GitHub repo. Let me, let me make sure I zoom in here and close a bunch of these that I'm not running anymore. All right, so we have this bedrock overview. This thing shows you, you know, how to install um, and, you know, get the latest Bodo 3. So Bodo 3 is our Python SDK and um, that contains the new bedrock code. So as of a certain version, this contains calls out to bedrock and you can access it. Here, we're using a fairly recent version of Langchain. If you're not familiar, Langchain changes on like an hourly basis. You could start the day on version 309 and you can end the day on, you know, version uh, 327. So keep an eye on that. Uh, it's both good and bad. You you get the latest and, you know, sometimes some things get deprecated and you have to really be careful. We've created this utility that a lot of our samples use just called Bedrock and it uh, gives you a simple API here, get Bedrock clients. Um, the one thing to note, and they actually added this right before going GA, is Bedrock really comes in two kind of modes, I guess I'll call them, which would be the bedrock uh, sort of control plane, in which case you would say runtime equals false. That's a little bit confusing. Um, that gives you access to the control plane features of um, bedrock. Uh, so let me actually get this going here. Here's where you can see the list of the foundation models. Now, uh, you know, I'm using an internal account here that has some of these models are named a little bit differently. And uh, we've got some of the newer models that are not yet GA. Uh, so I'm just gonna zip through here, but for the most part, you know, I have access to the same models uh, most of you have with uh, the exception of maybe one or two that are in, in preview. But um, now when I actually wanna run some things using uh, either, you know, Titan or AI21 Jurassic or Anthropics Claude, I could see some of the examples here. Now note that the, the prompt structures are different between these models. And so that's something to pay attention to, uh, even between the, you know, text to text mo models where this prompt requires, a, you know, slash n slash n uh, human and then slash n slash n answer. That's just how these models work. Um, we did not want to ask the model providers to change their like APIs. They, they've been testing and fine tuning these models with these specific prompt structures for you know years. And we um, are just you know simply passing through those prompts um, all within the security context of like AWS, IAM security, all the you know private link. Um, and so these are some of the benefits of bedrock. Now, you could do all this with SageMaker, but you would have to set up a lot of this infrastructure yourself. 
Um, and here it's just simply uh, converting your input into, you know, JSON, invoking the model here, and then, you know, getting a response. So let's go to Claude here. Let's see if we can get one going. Uh, oh, deny not. I didn't install something here. You have to switch to the data plane. Gotcha. You know that error, like the back of your hand, don't you? <laughs> okay. So where do I switch the data plan? I think I do it again, right over here. So here I say it's the exact same call, but I pass runtime equals true. And this is needed to in call the invoke model from the data plane. So that, that's an easy one to guess. And let's do this here. Here I'm using Claude V2. So someone asked if that was, um, Okay, and this is making the call. Taking a second here. And this is write me a blog about making strong business decisions as a leader. Always a fun one. Uh, link to, okay, someone's asking to post the link. Is that to this uh, GitHub repo, I think? So paste it here again. All right, I don't know why this is taking longer than normal. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's how you would call these. Each of these has their own different model IDs. Um, this one has some error handling included here. You can also do stable diffusion, which is fun. This is text to image. And you can also stream the data back. So, you know, if you, I'm sure, have used ChatGPT or any of the other chatbots where they can respond sort of incrementally, you know, as text is coming back, these models do generate a single token, um, you know, and as it's producing these tokens, you can actually send it out uh, back to the customer. Ansha, Chris Bird is asking if I can address this question. Can you summarize this question? somewhere. Okay, and here's some more Claude examples. We'll show those here. Oh, okay, so this one's, so, oh yeah, this is actually coming back in a streaming manner. So the other one hopefully came back up here. Yeah, yeah, this one finally came back and then when we do it in a stream, so now we're doing the exact same call, but we're turning on the streaming response mode. And um, okay, so that's that's kind of the the, the quick um, overview of Bedrock. The cool thing is is, is it all integrates with uh, the AWS security model S3, um, all the you know IAM permissions. Okay, so let me get through one more here, and I do want to highlight a few different ways to do RAG with like really any model, but here we are using Bedrock. So you can do, um, okay. So let's see, you could search, let's do here. You can, so as Farouk and folks were, were talking about, you know, what we're doing is we are augmenting our prompt with relevant information from a third party data source, right? So let's, let's in like this case, we've loaded up, um, and I think I actually have a nice overview. Sorry for the scrolling here. I wanna find an image that I'm looking for. Let me find it, images, I go review. So this is an image, I think we actually use this in the book as well too, but there's sort of a, so like when it comes to RAG, there's what I would call the sort of administrator persona. And then we have the, the consumer or the user persona. So sort of offline, the admin is loading up, you know, PDFs or these could be URLs off the internet or, you know, they could be links to your, intranet, you know, documents in, inside of your internal website. The admin is going to split up this data and there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And like Langchain supports quite a lot of these different splitters. 
And then those get stored into a vector store, or if you're using a very simple vector store would be uh, the face, F-A-I-S-S, which uses disk to store. Um, but you could use something like OpenSearch um, or like Pinecone. And this is really now where we're going to be querying from. So here's the, so once this step is done, now the, the actual consumer, um, based on, you know, Farouk's talk there, it would be that the tenant user that logs in, they would perform some, a query on this, this vector store to get me documents that are similar or get me, you know, parts of a document that are similar to my, to the question. Um, a second step that can happen is what's called the re-ranking and re-ranking is a little bit difficult to kind of explain but the like intuition really is you don't always have to return the you know the most relevant um you know top top three or top five uh um you know excerpts that come out of the vector store retrieval you can actually uh start to um, like diversify your results and potentially re-rank based on, you know, different strategies, right? Like different things. So you're not always in, right? Like necessarily going to get the, the three top most relevant, but maybe start to explore the way I sort of explain it is if you're familiar with like, you know, multi-arm bandits or with reinforcement learning where you're, you either exploit or you explore and you want kind of a healthy mix of exploring and and exploiting so here exploiting would be just always return the the top three or the top five um, and we're with the re-ranker you actually give the system permission to you know maybe dig deeper into the results and let's explore some other you know non-top three top five answers and potentially surface them and and see how those those work. So there is a factor, I believe it's called the um, like re-ranking ratio or, or, or the rank ratio that will let you explore um, with, you know, different um, uh, uh, like degrees. Okay. So once the user makes this call, what actually goes to the LLM is the prompt, but also this extra context that was retrieved. Okay. So it, it took, for example, the, if the prompt had a question, it first retrieved from the vector store and then did some potential re-ranking of those results and then stuffs the prompt with the context and then calls the LLM. So that's really the basis of all of this. And this is called uh, semantic similarity search, often just called uh, similarity search or semantic search or semantic similarity. People have different ways to describe it, but um, ultimately we are doing and the the opposite of this is a keyword search, and so there's a lot of you know discussion online um, about you know what's better, keyword search, semantic search. Um, oftentimes, we're I've in like recent weeks actually been seeing people that apply both a keyword search, you know, traditional go to Google type in keywords, and and you know something comes back um, as, and they're starting to like combine it with semantic search. Okay? And semantic search is, you know, through the vector space, um, as I believe Farouk pointed out earlier. So there's ways to do the re-ranking, which we show here. So this is an example of a re-ranking. Um, and same, you know, picture here, but there's going to be, I think it's called a ratio. And the ratio, I believe, is the variable name. That's how you would change um, and explore Oh, so it's the re-ranker top N and then the vector retrieval top K. So I guess this one does it slightly differently. Um, this is this is also using Llama index. Um, and uh, I believe with, uh, this, is using, this is using Llama index, I believe with uh, Langchain as well. So lots of different ways to do it here. We are about five minutes over. So let me just show, there's there's one other thing that's worth pointing out here, which is metadata filtering. So while you can do your semantic search and you know project through this vector space and and try to return documents and parts of documents that are specifically relevant to your prompt, 
you may also want to apply metadata filtering. And by metadata, I mean, as I'm entering, as I'm performing the like admin function here, where I'm loading documents into my document store, I can include, right, uh, certain metadata, like the year that this document. So these are the Amazon shareholder letters between 2019 and uh, 2022. And it, by adding this extra metadata during load time, I can actually then use that metadata later to filter my results and say, okay, do your um, your uh, like vector search, but make sure that you only include the last two years, so 22, 21, and not return anything 2020 and 2019. And you can have all kinds of metadata. And so, you know, this is where we could start to have a little bit more control also about what, what data is being returned. So if you wanted to narrow this down by line of business within your like enterprise where you are only going to return, you know, um, uh, documents from the like HR department or the finance department, then you could scope it down by that as well. Okay. And so this is where, you know, some of the, uh, um, uh, more advanced features of a vector database would start to help out as well too. And so here, we're, here we have examples across Titan and Claude. Um, and yeah, there's there's lots and lots in here. I encourage you to try it out. Ancha, any high level questions we should address? Yeah, we, we had a higher level question around how would you architect structured data access? Right. So, and yeah, I assume that would be tabular data. Um, right. I don't have any examples of that, although I did see some examples at a recent conference where they were doing that. Um, yeah, I can potentially add an example here. And that's really where you would want to start to take advantage of some of the more structured data benefits of a database. And the closest thing here would be the metadata, um, but you can also extend this out to take advantage of the, um, right, like the other columns in your uh, database. But I have to think about that because I do remember seeing an example and there were there was quite a lot of interest and people asking questions around that. but. I haven't captured it here. Yeah, and along yeah. the same lines, uh, similar how to embed relational data. Right, right. Um, yeah, I have to think about that a little bit. Um, those were a lot of the questions. Do you remember, Anshay? Because I can't remember if you were in that same session. If they, if they were pre-processing the data to get it into an index. But yet somehow still preserving. Yeah, I think yeah, the example that I saw was specific, like specific extraction of parts of the data, where you're defining like data classes, right? Oh, was it that talk? Was it the? Yeah, good. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. circle back on that topic. I know it's a it's a big big question. Many have. Yeah, maybe let's track someone down to to talk about that next month. Um, I think that's a good one. Okay. Is it possible to do MMR with LangChain and OpenSearch? Yes, absolutely. So MMR is the, um, that's the ranking. Uh, and yes, you can do that. Absolutely. And I think I have an example. Open, let's see, OpenSearch serverless, Bedrock, LangChain. Um, I might have been using Llama Index here instead. I kind of went back and forth just to try out different things, but uh, I don't see why there wouldn't be a way to do it. We just might not have an example of it. But yeah, um, open. In fact, actually, in fact, I think the book actually has an example, Ansha. That was one of those where, where the book had had an example that we hadn't yet backported into the GitHub repo. So I will take a note and make sure it's in here. 
All right. And then I think we had a couple of questions here about how easy is it to, to replicate those notebooks here and set up the infrastructure. Um, the notebooks you're showing, Chris, um, do they require GPU? They do not, right? No, when when you're working with Bedrock, you don't have to have a GPU um, as long because Bedrock takes care of all of that for you. Yeah, like that's one of Ancha's favorite features of, of Bedrock is that you don't have to think about the GPUs <laughs> or the the Trainium or, or you know the Inferentia instances. It's all back there. It's all you know. There's um, there are uh, throughput you know, numbers and like SLAs and, and things like that, that, um, and there's something called provisions uh, throughput as well too, where you can guarantee a specific set of throughput, a uh, number of throughput, and you don't have to worry about the GPUs or the um, hardware behind it. So to replicate and run these notebooks here, um, can folks just get clone and then run those notebooks? I think those are pretty much using Bedrock right through the API. Yeah, you, the Titan ones, which are the, the beginning ones, unfortunately, are uh, Titan is not yet GA, so you would have to get access to that. Um, but the Claude examples will run uh, right out of the box. Now, the other stuff that will run out of the box is 09 is our RAG chapter, and this doesn't use Bedrock. Um, we, we, you know, in the chapters leading up to Bedrock, we kind of show the fundamentals and then we show how to do all of the same things pretty much, but with Bedrock. So um, the short of it is stick with the Bedrock Claude samples for right now. And then um, when Titan becomes GA, then you'll have access to those. Yeah, cost, uh, I. Don't know. So Claude has their own pricing. I believe Claude is public. There, or sorry, the Claude pricing um, is is public somewhere. It's publicly documented. Uh, Bedrock. Um, but just remember, it's you are paying for just the the usage. So um, every request in, you know, you're you're charged by the number of tokens coming in. Um, Bedrock Claude. Pricing. Yeah, so here's I got all the it pricing here. here. Yeah, I pasted the link. You find it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. on our website. And so you would have to kind of figure out roughly the number or the, the number. It's I think it's price per million tokens or something. Um, okay, Amlin, what is your per, last question? Per thousand tokens, yeah. Oh, per thousand. Okay, Amlin, are you looking for the link to the GitHub repo? Can post that here. Yeah, I think Amlin had a question. We have observed that out of many PDFs, the weightage is provided most to the largest file in a POC based on FICE. Did you face similar issues? Ah, I have seen similar issues. Yeah. Um, it's for the most largest file in the piece of based on yeah I've seen something now uh, assuming that you're using chunking um you know it, it it means you're probably providing more chunks for that particular PDF um so one of the hyperparameters that we always end up tuning you know think of it like a traditional um uh, like hyperparameter with you know machine learning deep learning is the size of that chunk is the like overlapping is the the splitter strategy uh, I tend to use the recursive splitter I think is in a lot of the, the code here um, so but yes I've seen similar things the like other thing is these models tend to um, prefer either the beginning of your prompt you know, um, or the the very end of your prompt. It, it's just kind of a, and so depending on, you know, and, and prompt here being your instruction, maybe asking a question as well as the context that's retrieved. And you you sort of have to find the right chunk size that, that fits into that. It's gonna greatly depend on the context window size. So if your context window size is 2048 or, 4096, you sort of have to try to align with that um, context window size. Uh, so 
really, really not a good answer there, but I have seen what you're hinting at here, which is some of the larger PDFs. That that typically has been because there's there's more chunks coming from those PDFs. Um, but if yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult. I would also encourage trying to set up some of the MMR stuff where you're doing re-ranking um, and you know potentially seeing if that fixes anything. There was another question about the size of the the um, embeddings. Did you see that question, Ansha? I, I, I think we're out of time, but um, the embedding size, so Amazon, our Titan models, there was a version that had 4,096 was the embedding size, and, and I, but I think the newer version has uh, 1,500, like around 1,500 like embedding size. And, you know, often the, the larger the embedding size, the, the, you know, better is going to be the, um, that like embedding model to represent your text, but 1500 ha seems to be kind of the sweet spot and it's small enough where you can actually fit quite a bit into memory. Um, and, you know, 4096 appeared to be a little bit overkill, but, uh, you know, try both variations and, and see which one works for you. Okay. Anything else, Ancha, or should we wrap it up here? We're about 20 minutes over. Yeah, I know. Let's uh, let's wrap it up for today. Okay, except the rest of the models do not input. Um, okay, yeah, I think we should wrap it up. And if you have any further questions, you can hit us up on. We have a public Slack channel as well, right? So we get the link for that maybe. But um, awesome. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next month, and we're gonna have more. Rag uh, uh, specials coming. People seem to love this topic, and yeah, always a bunch of great questions. So, and yeah, curious to hear more about your feedback as well. And um, we will see you next month. See you next month. Thanks Bye, so everyone. much.